Good morning, Ruby Mountain Bible Church. Welcome to our virtual service this week. We're glad to have you with us. Boy, we miss you guys, and we can't wait till we can reconvene, um, Lord willing, soon. But while we while we can't, this is our next best option. So let's go ahead. We'll pray, and then we'll do some singing together. Father, thank you so much for this morning to um, spend some time singing together, encouraging one another with um, spiritual songs. And Father, we really miss being able to meet corporately as a church, and you know that. Um, Lord, would you please let us meet soon, according to your will and your timing. But Lord, while we wait, would you help us to be creative um, in considering ways to provoke one another to love and to good works, to practice the one another commands. And Father, we pray that you would be honored and exalted in our hearts and in our lives as we live out your truths during this difficult time. Lord, we thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. So our first song we'll sing here this morning is To God Be the Glory. So I'd encourage you to sing right along with me, then you won't hear me singing, all right? To God Be the Glory. the glory, great things he hath done, so loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded at his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord. singing. We're going to sing another one here together. It's called O Church Arise. O Church Arise. And it's okay if you don't know this one. Um, we're going to sing the first stanza through two times. The first time, if you don't know it, just kind of listen to me sing it and hopefully you can kind of get the hang of it. And then we'll sing the first verse again and sing through the rest of it, okay? So, O Church Arise. <laughs> call of Christ our captain. For now the weak can say that they are strong in the hand that God has given. With shield of faith and belt of truth, we'll stand against the Reach 
reaching out to those in darkness. So now hopefully you've got the tune a little bit and join in with me as we sing stanzas one through four. Here we go. Oh church arise and put your armor on. Hear the call of Christ our In the strength that God has given, with shield of faith and belt of truth, we'll stand against the devil's lies. An army bold whose battle cry is love, reaching out to those in darkness. But to rage against the captor And with the sword that makes the wounded whole We will fight with faith and valor When faced with trials on every side We know the outcome is secure And Christ will have for which he died, an inheritance of nations. Come see the cross where love and mercy meet, as the Son of God is stricken. Then see his foes lie crushed beneath his feet, for the conqueror And as the stone is rolled away, and Christ emerges from the grave, this victory march continues till the day, every high and heart shall see. Give grace for every hurdle That we may run with faith to win the prize Of a servant good and faithful As saints of old still line the way Retelling triumphs of His grace We hear the call When with Christ we stand in glory, when with Christ we stand in glory. Amen. We'll turn it over to Pastor Jeff. Welcome here this morning, Ruby Mountain Bible Church. Great to have everybody in. Glad you could tune in here with us. What we're going to do today is for the next couple of weeks, we're going to change gears a little bit. We're going to make a new focus of our time together, and we're going to focus on the church. And the reason for this is, of course, I've gotten a number of questions. I've thought through a number of questions that perhaps you yourself have thought of, or several of you have already asked me about, concerning the nature of the church. We live in fascinating times and so the point is, we are living in difficult, fascinating, even unprecedented times, you could say, and our inability to meet publicly together has, of course, led to a number of questions when it comes to the definition of church. What is church? How are we supposed to function as a church? And rightfully so, these are important questions. But there are some things that we have talked about in our study of Acts. It's been a little while, as we, of course, been in the book of Acts. But what I'd like to do here today is go back and, and revisit some concepts that we have been looking at, or we already have seen thus far in our study of the book of Acts, 
but in particular to address some of the issues that has uh, that our current situation with the inability to meet publicly, the social distancing, the teaching virtually, etc., issues that, that these circumstances have caused to arise. And they're important issues, uh, things that we need to be talking about, practical. And so what I'd like to do is for this week and next is to look at some of these ideas, to revisit the book of Acts, particularly Acts chapter 2, to talk through some of these things and see how practical these ideas are and how contemporary they are for our time and place and the situation that we're going through. So let's begin with a word of prayer and then we're going to jump in and we're going to see what we can accomplish here today. I trust it'll be an encouragement and challenge to you. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for that very reality, that Lord, you are first our Father, that you love us, that you are the one who sent us your Son. As the scriptures say, you delivered him up unto us for our good, and that is the greatest demonstration of love that history has ever seen. And so we thank you for revealing yourself to us as Father. But aside from that, we also are thankful that you are our Father in heaven, that you are the sovereign God of the universe. The Lord is crazy and chaotic as things have been down here on this earth. We recognize that, Lord, ultimately, you sit on the throne. You are not surprised by these things. You yourself are uh, the grand orchestrator of all of history, and we thank you that we can confide in those realities. So, Lord, we ask your blessing upon this time here today as we look into uh, these ideas, as we are confronted as a church, the church of the living God, as the Bible says, we are confronted with some rather fascinating circumstances that we find ourselves in. So as a result, we are going back and we're thinking, we're rethinking perhaps through our definition. What is church? Uh, what are we supposed to be doing as the church of the living God, no matter our circumstances we find ourselves in? So Father, please guide and direct in this time my thoughts, my speech, that Lord, uh, your word would be clearly evidenced and emphasized here this morning. So God, we commit our time, ourselves to you afresh. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, <clears throat> again, just kind of introducing our uh, study here today and next week. I think I'd like to take the next couple of weeks to focus on this. But the reality is, based upon several of the questions that I have received, I believe it's timely for us to revisit some concepts that we have observed from our study in the book of Acts. And in particular, what I'd like to do is go back to visit Acts chapter 2. And we're gonna, I want to recall the context, and I want to reread this passage here together as we look at uh, the, these, some of these major concepts. But recall the book of Acts in our study that we've looked at thus far, Acts chapter 2 is, of course, the, the Feast of Pentecost. It's the event where the Lord Jesus, as he promised he would, he sent the Spirit of God to, in fulfillment to his promise, and he, he empowered his church. This, of course, leads to the preaching of the very first Christian sermon, if you want to call it that, where the Apostle Peter stands and he addresses the crowd that gathers he is standing probably on the southern steps of the Temple Mount or perhaps in the temple complex itself. But he addresses his crowd. He arrives to the end of the sermon wherein he proclaims the risen Lord, the reality of having our sins forgiven, the necessity of repentance and faith in this risen Lord. And then as we get to the end of that chapter, the end of his sermon, this is what the text reports. We're actually going to pick it up in verse 40 of the text. But the Bible says this, and with many other words did he testify. I'm just going to read it again, picking it up in verse 40, down to verse 47. It says, and with many other words did he, Peter, testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward or this rebellious generation. He goes on, then they that gr gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about three thousand souls, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things in common. And they sold their possessions and the goods they separated to all men 
as every man had need. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple, in the breaking of bread from house to house, and did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now, with these verses, what I'd like to do is revisit some concepts that we've already seen in our study of the book of Acts. But again, it's been a while. We've been in the book of Acts for uh, an extended period of time at this point. We're about, we're about halfway through the book. But what I'd like to do is revisit this rather seminal passage, which is a portrait of the early church. It's like a picture, a snapshot of the early Christian church as we get a glimpse of a day in the life of the early church. And as we look at this, what I'd like to do is I want to just quickly talk about four big ideas. I want to first talk about the identity of the church, the identity of the church. And then we'll talk about the activity of the church, not just who is the church, what is the church, who, what makes up the church. But secondly, what's the activity of the church? What is, what is the church doing? What are they up to? What are they preoccupied with? Thirdly, as we see in this passage, verses 43 to 47, I want to look at the influence of the church. What was the church doing, their activity, but how was it impacting the world around them? What was the influence that the church had? But then in particular, what I want to focus on is some ideas that we see not just in this text in Acts chapter 2, but then the rest of the book of uh, Acts, as well as um, the rest of the New Testament, that really deal with some of the issues that we are facing now. And I want to kind of focus on and camp on this concept of what I call the resilience of the church, the resilience of the church. And so I I trust to make this very helpful and practical to respond to a number of questions I've received, as well as kind of forecast ahead. There's, There's a number of things we're facing as a church here in America, worldwide, obviously, but there's things that we're facing that will, it's confronting our way of doing church. And that's okay. The Lord is in control. The Lord's in charge. But it's requiring us to go backwards and redefine the basics. What is church? Our identity, activity, influence, and resilience. So with that said, let's just jump right in. I want to begin by just looking at that very first point, the identity of the church. And look with me again, if you would just, if you got your Bibles open, just reread that section in verse 40 and 41 when it says, And they that gladly receive, or excuse me, and with many other words did he, Peter, testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward or rebellious generation. And then it says, They that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now, as simple as that sounds, that verse, particularly verse 41, gives us the identity of the church. What is it that makes up? Who is it that makes up the church? Well, as I just throw there in your notes, number one, those it says that gladly heard or heard and gladly received the message of Christ. Now, again, encourage you on your own time, you can go back and review some of these sessions we've already had in the book of Acts. Go back and just take the time to reread the earlier portion of Acts chapter 2. But what's going on here is that we see the message of the risen Lord, who is both Lord and Christ, as Peter makes a big emphasis. He is the sovereign But he is also, you know, Lord, he's the sovereign ruler, creator of the universe, but he's also the Christ. He is the one who was foretold of by the Old Testament. He is the one by whom, through whom, we have forgiveness of our sins and reconciliation with our creator. And these realities that Peter proclaimed, what you and I, in summary, would call the gospel of the Lord Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel message is what Peter proclaimed. Well, the church is made up, it consists of those who heard and gladly received the message of Christ. In fact, the text tells us that this number was in fact 3,000 souls right there in verse 41. There were more than that, apparently, that were listening to the message, but not everybody who heard the message received it gladly. But Peter says that not only as he preached to this crowd, he says, repent, be baptized, receive the forgiveness of sins offered in the Lord Jesus Christ. As he declared that message, only a select group responded to that. They received the message of Christ. And as Peter says, come out of this rebellious generation, this untoward generation. 
they responded. They came out. They repented of their sin. They recognized. Remember the word repentance means a change of mind, a change of heart, which leads to a change of behavior. They recognized their sin is what's killing them, that they are indeed part of an untoward or rebellious gener- generation. Now, <clears throat> the idea of that, of course, is is recall in the book of Luke, chapter 9, chapter 11. Uh, we see it recorded in, in fact, most of the gospel rec- records will say this. Jesus, in his ministry, likened his generation to a rebellious generation. Why? Because though he declared the message of himself, offered the forgiveness of sins, largely speaking, not exclusively, but largely speaking, that nation, that that generation of the children of Israel rejected his message. They rejected the claims of Jesus. So as a result, they were a rebellious generation. Well, now Peter, standing up, is declaring the claims of Christ. As an eyewitness of the resurrection, Peter is saying, look, we are declaring to you the risen Lord. Everything Jesus said about himself is true. I am here to bear witness of this fact. He is the risen Lord. And so he says, leave this untoward, is the King James translation, or the rebellious generation. In other words, don't reject Jesus as the Messiah, just like the rest of the uh, Uh, the nation of Israel has been guilty of, the leadership of the the nation of Israel, the Sanhedrin, is guilty of by putting Jesus to death. He says, "Don't, don't respond likewise. Rather, come out of that wicked generation and gladly receive the message. He's calling them to have, he's calling upon them to have faith in the reality of Jesus as the risen Lord and Christ, the only means to have our sins forgiven. But then he says, he challenges them to declare this boldly, to publicly confess their faith in Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah, and identify publicly with those who believe in this message. How are they to do this? Via baptism. He says, repent and be baptized, he says back up in verse 38. And the reality is, Peter is calling his audience to, number one, believe well, repent of their sin, to recognize it was a sin what they did to Jesus. Number two, to repent of that sin and acknowledge that Jesus is who he says he is. He is both Lord and Christ. When believing that message, responding in faith, they receive forgiveness of sins. But then he says, you need to be baptized. You need to identify publicly with this group of people who are believers in the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as Peter does this, notice how important and practical uh, of a reality this is. The idea of publicly being baptized and identifying with this group. Because the church, what is the church? We're talking about the identity of the church. It is people who identify with Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah. Those who have believed the gospel message, they are rallying around. We might come from a variety of different backgrounds, ethnically, economically, what have you, but we rally around this one central truth. Jesus is the Christ. He is the risen Lord. He is the means to have our sins forgiven. And this reality of our confession of faith in this is what gives us entrance into this thing that Jesus, recall earlier in his ministry and then Peter now, is defining as the church. The church is not a building. It's people. It's people who rally around the gospel. They trust in Jesus as both Lord and Christ. And they identify with him via baptism. Now, again, just recall the events of the book of Acts chapter 2. As I throw there up on the screen, we have the event of Pentecost. Just like Jesus said, he would send forth the Spirit. He says, go tarry in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high, he says, back in Acts chapter 1. That's exactly what they do. The disciples, the apostles, uh, a group of 120, the apostles and uh, and then, of course, the disciples, gather around in the upper room. They pray. They wait. The Spirit of God falls on the day of Pentecost. The little tongues of fire, as you can see here on the screen uh, in this picture, the little tongues of fire coming uh, on top of each individual believer, the presence of God in the midst. Well, as this happens, the Spirit of God fills the disciples that are gathered in the upper room, and then they go to the Temple Mount. And, And Peter, as I said a moment ago, proclaims what you might call the first Christian message, meaning it's the content is Christian, uniquely Christian 
meaning they are declaring Jesus as both Lord and Christ. He is the fulfillment of the expectation of Messiah. He is the Lord who has risen from the grave. He is the only one who uh, offers forgiveness of sins and freedom from our sins. And again, if you recall some of our previous studies, particularly in, in our uh, geography, biblical geography class, the upper room is most likely located right down here, as you can see on the screen, located right down here. And the, the sermon Peter is, is preaching is most likely given right here on the southern steps of the Temple Mount. This Temple Mount is a 35-acre complex right here upon which sits the temple proper. But right on the southern steps is probably where Peter's standing when he declares this message. Why do we think that? Well, again, recall the southern steps. This was the primary uh, entrance up into the Temple Mount in the first century. It has, if you recall our, st our previous studies and the Holda Gates and all that good stuff, the Southern Steps is the most pro prominent uh, entrance up into the Temple Mount. They would walk through these little gates right here. It would be a tunnel, and here's another set of gates. They would walk through there. There would be a tunnel that would bring them out up into this temple complex. Right here is the Royal Stoa, as it's called, which is probably, as we'll see in just a moment, where the early disciples of the Lord Jesus, the, the early Christian church, gathered in a public forum. They gathered there atop the Temple Mount, the Bible says, probably right there beneath that uh, Royal Stoa. And But then, of course, here is the temple proper. But as Peter declares this uh, Christian message, and he calls the children of Israel, and well, all who are gathered there, largely Israeli, largely Jews, he calls them to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He then says, if you believe this message, identify with us as a group via baptism. Now, this right here is a picture of the modern day Temple Mount. If you recall our studies, we've looked at this before. But what I want you to see is right here on the southern steps there has been a number of excavations that have taken place here. And one of the things that they have found is, is nearly 40, or just over 40, if I recall, what are called mikvaot, which are baptismal fonts. Do you recall this? They are discovered right here, as you can see there on the screen, right here in the southern steps of the Temple Mount. And a mikvaot is simply this, and you can see it right there on the screen. It, we actually see a, a whole tractate in the Mishnah dedicated to this, but there is uh, there's around 40 of these have been discovered, and it's basically a baptismal font where a worshiper would descend these steps, as you can see here. They would totally immerse themselves, and they would typically come down one side, immerse themselves, and then come back up the other side. And the point is, it was a means of cleansing some someone would cleanse themselves as they approach the temple proper. Here is actually a picture of one of those mikvaot that have been uh, discovered there. This is actually filled with uh, rainwater. <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, these there's a, just a bunch of these, scores of these, right there, right? At least 40 that have been discovered on the southern steps of the Temple Mount. And this is exactly, most likely, this is, this is the place where Peter, not only when he says, hey, he preaches the message, but when he says, be baptized... This is what they do. I think the believers, the 3,000 souls that trust in Jesus and the gospel message that Peter proclaims, they then go down to these mikvaot and they are baptized in uh, these, these mikvaot. And they are identifying, because of, remember what Jesus said, go into all, all the world, Matthew 20, 28, verse 19 and 20, and preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the idea is they are being baptized, not as Jews, but as Christians, people who believe Jesus of Nazareth is both Lord and Christ. They believe the message that Peter just proclaimed. Now, what's so fascinating about this is they're being baptized again in the shadow of the Temple Mount. Right up here on the Temple Mount is where, again, this royal stoa, <clears throat> and over on this side, is the, uh, the east side, is, is an area known as Solomon's Porch, this is where the Sanhedrin gathers. This is the the Sanhedrin, recall, is the body of Jewish leadership that put Jesus to death just days, well, a few weeks before. And now Peter is calling upon people to trust in that very Jesus that was just crucified by the religious leaders in the shadow of the Temple Mount. He's saying, come and be baptized and declare your personal faith in the Lord Jesus as the Messiah, the Christ. So that's extremely important. 
But what then happens? Well, it tells us in the next part of the text that if you were to continue reading verse 42, it says, and they, that would be the 3,000 souls that responded to the gospel message, believers in Jesus, believers in the gospel, what do they do? Well, it says in verse 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. So what I want you to see is not only the identity of the church, what is the church? The church is not a building, it's people. People who believe in Jesus as both Lord and Christ, who have publicly identified with a group who believe likewise. They have been baptized. They're following the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, now what? That's who they are, but what do they do? Not just their identity, but their activity. Well, this text, very helpful, verse 42 of our passage, gives us four things that is that typified the early Christian church. And I'm just going to list them. Number one, they continued, as it says here, in the apostles' doctrine, namely biblical truth. Now, we could go long and hard on this, and I have in our bibliology study. I'm just going to summarize this briefly. But it says they continued steadfastly in four things. Uh, Recall, continued steadfastly. That's one of my favorite little uh, Greek words. The Greek word itself was used of siege warfare. Which recall, for instance, Nebuchadnezzar in the Old Testament took him 13 years to conduct a siege that he ultimately triumphed over the city of Tyre. Um, The point is, a siege could take a really long time, right? The walled city, you have people retreat inside their walls. They hide in there. The army that is sieging, they surround the city. They besiege the city. They're trying to cut them off from all resources and starve them out or, or, you know, scale the wall or go into the wall, whatever. They're trying to conquer that city. Well, the, the, a siege, the point is, a siege could take a very, very long time. The Greeks used a particular word that described the sort of tenacity required to overcome a city in a siege. The sort of patience and tenacity that was required for people besieging a city. That word is the word that Luke uses here that's translated continue steadfastly. In the other words, these are things that we are to hold to tenaciously. We are not to compromise. This is the core of our activity, what we are to devote ourselves to. This is what Christians do. What? Four things. Number one, apostles' doctrine. Now, what that means is, of course, doctrine, teaching of the apostles, That is a body of truth that the apostles themselves declared. Jesus gave these men, that we call apostles, the authority to dictate to us truth. Jesus said in John 16, for instance, verse 13, Jesus in the upper room speaks to these men and he says, I will lead you into all truth. Well, in fact, he says, I will send you the Spirit who will lead you into all truth. But he's speaking of the apostles. The apostles have the ability authority, rather, delegated to them by Jesus himself to give us an authoritative body of truth. That is known as the Apostles' Doctrine. Well, as time went on, as the first century went on, the Apostles' Doctrine was later inscripturated, codified, if you will, in documents, what you and I call the New Testament. It is New Covenant literature given to us, handed down to us by the apostles. It is not separate from, it's not contrary to the Old Testament, but it is in addition to. We have new documents, New Testament literature that is given to us by the authority, through the authority of Jesus' delegates, the apostles. And so we, as the church, one of the things that we do is we devote ourselves to the study of the scriptures. All the scriptures, Genesis to Revelation, but in particular, what makes Christianity unique is that we have the New Testament. Jews hold to the Old Testament. So do we. But we also hold to the New Testament. They, you know, A Jew who rejects Jesus as Messiah does not. And so the reality is, what makes the church distinctive is that we have a New Testament. We acknowledge the authority of the doctrine and teaching that the apostles passed down to us. But secondly, it says they continued steadfastly also in fellowship. Yes, in the apostles' doctrine, number one. But number two, they continued in fellowship. Now, the word fellowship, koinonia, in the Greek is, and I've talked about this many times, and and I throw up a couple of passages there where this this idea surfaces, But fellowship is really defined in three ways. Number one, right there in your notes, I rehearsed this for you. Number one, fellowship or koinonia 
is it means common ground. The reality is, we as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, whatever differences we might have, and there's a lot of differences that we have. You might like vanilla, I like chocolate ice cream. Um, you might like, you know, uh, pineapple on your pizza, but I might not. The reality is, we have lots of differences. We might be different economically, our preferences, our ethnicity. We might come from a variety of backgrounds. But what brings us together, our common bond, is our belief in Jesus as the Messiah. We trust in the gospel message of Jesus Christ. That is our common ground. That's our foundation of fellowship. But fellowship, koinonia, that Greek word, is much more than just common ground. It's also used... For instance, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 5, to describe cooperation. It means we do stuff together. We team up. We yoke together. We work for a cause, a common cause. And this idea is important for us because the cause that we have been given is to go into all the world. We call it the Great Commission. Summarized in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. We are to go into all the world to make disciples of Jesus Christ, to teach those people to observe whatever Jesus has commanded us. And this idea of our goal that we are, have to accomplish, the word koinonia is actually used, for instance, in Philippians chapter 1, to describe the fellowship in the gospel, the cooperation, the teamwork that we have as believers to work side by side, shoulder to shoulder, if you will, to accomplish the Great Commission. We cooperate in a task. We are a team. But thirdly, this idea of fellowship is, yes, common ground, our, our belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, cooperation in the task that we have been given, the Great Commission. But thirdly, as we do those things, as we believe the same, and as we do the same thing, we act out the Great Commission... And we do that together, we experience a special thing that you and I might call camaraderie. It's that kinship, that brother, kindred, brother-like spirit that we have. The, the fellowship is the word. And the word fellowship, again, it, 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 the Greek word koinonia, translated fellowship, means all three of these things. But often when we use the word fellowship, what we're doing is referring to that final one. That spirit of friendship and joy that we have, the good Christian friends that we have, the accountability that we have between fellow believers. The importance of that cannot be overstated. It is so important. But the reality is, during this time, as, as we'll mention a little bit more in just a few moments, that is one of the things that is difficult in, in the current situation that we're facing. We all still have a copy, hopefully. If you don't, talk to me. I'll get you one. We all have a copy of the New Testament. We should be reading it. We should be studying it, not just the New Testament alone, right? But the Apostles' Doctrine, the, all the Bible. But we need to be reading it, studying it, learning and gleaning from the Scriptures. But this idea of fellowship is difficult right now as we're going through the social distancing uh, process. But nonetheless, this is one of the things that the church must rally around. This is one of the basic core markers of what I call the activity of the church, what we should be doing. And so we'll come back to that here in a few moments. But the other two things, the last two things that, that are mentioned by Luke, the author here in this text, is set, or the third, thirdly, they continued in the breaking of bread. The breaking of bread. Now, this phrase can mean one of two things, or more likely both. But it, I, can, I think it refers to the simple worship of particularly the Lord's table. Like if you were with us last week for our virtual communion, we shared the, uh, the breaking of bread together. The, the, we participated in the memorial that the Lord Jesus himself set up. That is a memorial that is distinctly Christian because it is to remember and reminisce of the body of Christ and the blood of Christ and what Jesus did in giving, of him, giving himself uh, for our sin on the cross of Calvary, rising again. And we talked about we talk about that much. We participate in that memorial much. But that is one of the things, it's a distinguishing marker of Christianity. The other thing that this might be referring to, the breaking of bread together, is a hospitality sort of thing. That Christians are getting together. Again, it's kind of that idea of fellowship. That we are 
sharing a meal together. That's like the common universal, you know, in every culture uh, throughout all time. It's a way of displaying camaraderie and kinship and, you know, cooperation, etc. Is to break bread together, to share a meal together. And so, but in particular, I think it can reference that, the idea of just breaking bread, sharing, you know, a meal together. But most specifically, it's referring to our participation in the Lord's table. That we are to do this regularly. The Bible doesn't say how often we have to do it. In fact, there's freedom in it. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 teaches us. But nonetheless, we need to be doing it because that is one of the key activities that makes us, you know, that that, uh, we as Christians participate in. That's what makes us unique as Christians. But then fourthly, the text tells us that they continued steadfastly in prayer. Now, in particular, this is one that we should be emphasizing all the time. We're often guilty of underemphasizing this, but think about the current situation where we are unable to meet publicly together, but nonetheless, as we're in our homes, as families, as individuals, are you continuing steadfastly in prayer? This is something that you can do, whether publicly or privately. doesn't matter. Social distancing should not in any way impact our ability to pray, other than perhaps giving us greater impetus to pray. We see the importance of prayer. Maybe we should be emphasizing it more than we are. And so I encourage you, are you praying as families? Are you enjoying that time as families? Are you calling up fellow uh, Christians, church members? And are you praying for them, praying with them? Prayer is absolutely essential. And there's actually four major words that are used in the Greek to, to reference prayer. And they basically, and uh, we could really get lost in this and spend time, and, and, and we have in past studies, and we will again in the future, to do word studies on each of these individual words for prayer. But basically, we could subdivide prayer, as I do there in your notes, into four major chunks. Number one, adoration. Adoration is when we come to God and we reminisce. We rehearse the goodness of God, the greatness of God. We we just adore who he is. This is when, for instance, in the Lord's Prayer, the, the, the or better, the Disciples' Prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught the disciples to pray. When he says we are to begin with our Father who art in heaven, the idea is we, we ignore, and he says, hallowed be thy name. We acknowledge our unique relationship with God as our Father. We, we pray to him as hallowed, and the word means holy, sanctified, set apart, one of a kind, in a total a category all to himself. And the idea is, is adoration. It's just coming to God and sitting down and adoring, just sitting in almost stunned, not necessarily silence. You can sit in stunned silence, but to rehearse verbally, to thank God for who he is. And I encourage you, <clears throat> if you struggle with this idea, what is adoration? Read the Psalms. Consult our Psalter series. Read, for instance, Psalm 145. Listen to, uh, even on our YouTube channel, we just recently posted a teaching on Psalm 145. It's one of the most... Um, uh, dense psalms in the Psalter that is practicing this idea of adoration, just thanking God, adoring God for who he is. We need to be actively doing this, daily doing this, listing off the attributes of God, focusing upon God in adoration. But secondly, the second major category of prayer that we see throughout the scripture, both Old and New Testament, is confession. Confession is us getting real before God. It is us doing a bit of introspection, recognizing our sin, coming to God, asking for his grace, asking for his forgiveness, which he is free to offer. He's willing to offer. He is he freely, graciously provides forgiveness. But the reality is, if we do not purposely, consistently, personally focus upon our own sinfulness, then we will never appreciate the grace that God gives us. This has been a big theme that I, I'd like to develop more in the near future, but a big theme of my personal study in, the, in the, just the recent past is the reality that the gospel means little to me unless, and the grace of God is not impressive to me unless I see the depth of my own sin. And we need to get real and think about our own sinfulness often, intentionally, deeply. Confess our sinfulness. Ask God for forgiveness. Receive that forgiveness. That's a vital part of our prayer life that should be regular. 
But so many times we don't think about it unless we really blow it. And then we come to God and say, oh, by the way, forgive me for that because I kind of messed up. And then we move on. Rather than dwelling upon the depth of our own depravity and the goodness of God's grace to love us in spite of ourselves. Adoration, confession. Number three is petition. This is where we come for just asking requests. We say, God, you know, and like Jesus taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. Lord, I have a need. I have a health issue. I have, uh, you know, a, a concern. And we come to God asking for his grace and we just bring petitions before the Lord. Petition is similar but distinct from the fourth category, which is intercession. Petition is when I ask a request for myself. Something I am going through. I come as First Peter chapter five verse seven, one of my favorite verses on prayer, as First Peter five seven declares, we should we come and we cast our needs, our cares upon Him because He, God, cares for us. And so the idea is we just come and we unburden ourselves. We we pour out our heart, as the psalmist says, pour out our heart before God. That's petition when we do it for ourselves. Intercession is when we do it for someone else. We come and we ask for God's grace for someone else. And we are praying that God would do something in their life. We, we, you know, and the idea is we're, pre- we're presenting their request on their behalf. That's intercession. But the reality is the church, Christianity should be actively known for continuing steadfastly in prayer. That's a challenge that we need to take more seriously. But what I want to see just quickly is the influence of the church. So, The church who is gathering together, banding together, those believers in Jesus Christ, the church is not a building, it's people who believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, who have publicly identified via baptism in their belief in Jesus Christ. They're steadfastly continuing in the apostles' doctrine, the and fellowship, breaking of bread, in uh, prayers, plural, all forms of prayer. But when we do this, what is our influence? What does the church accomplish? Well, notice in this passage what happens. It says that fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles and all that believed were together and had all things in common. They sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men and, and every man had, as every man had need. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple and the breaking of bread from house to house. And they did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and have favor, having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. That passage gives us, lists off a number of things that I'm just going to rehearse here quickly that highlight the influence that the church was having. Number one, what was the influence of the church? Number one, fear. As I say there in your notes, all who witnessed this early Christian church feared. Fear is not necessarily the equivalent of faith. There were people who saw the church, even unbelievers who witnessed the church, that feared. They stood in awe of, of what God was doing because result, again, notice, as I put there in the notes, fear is a, is a respect, an awe resulting from the recognition that God is near and God is at work. Every time we see this idea in the, in the Bible, the fear of God, it, it's, it's a response to when people see God. Like when he descends upon Mount Sinai and, and the whole mountain bursts into flame. It says the people fear. Whenever God shows up and he manifests himself in a very real and tangible way, the result is fear. It's an awe. It's a, it's a sense of the divine presence. And even unbelievers in the city of Jerusalem around that saw what God was doing through the early Christian church they might not even have believed in the message of Christ, but they still had an awareness. There is something different about these people. God is in their midst. They are people of God. And so the reality is, when we do these things, when we are rallying around the gospel message, we're, we're uh, actively continuing steadfastly in those four things. In verse 42, the result is, people see and have a sense that we are the people of God. There's something different about us. But secondly, the text tells us that they also had favor. This is the result of recognizing the goodness, kindness, and unity between the community of believers. In other words, remember what Jesus said in John chapter 13, verse 35, that they will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And so the reality is, the early Christian church was so good at loving each other that people, as they looked at them, 
they said, wow, they favored, they might not agree with the Christians, but they favored him. And they said, these people are good people, honest people, kind people. Look at how they love one another. And I think this is something that is so powerful. And this is something that is powerful at any time or place. This is something that you and I today, our love for one another, our care for one another. In fact, I was just talking to a church member uh, this week who says, you know what, I, I just, I'm loving the fact that I'm getting calls almost every day from someone else in the church who is showing their concern. They're praying for me. They're asking, hey, how are you doing? And they were encouraged by that. <clears throat> but the reality is, are you participating in that? Are you caring for the local church here, Reuben Mountain Bible Church? Are you caring for those who are in the church? Are you calling them? Are you, are you showing an interest in them? When you show that sort of love, people see the goodness of the Christian movement. And when we see, when people see our power, our faithfulness, our purity, our goodness and our kindness and our unity one to another, then it results in that third thing, forward progress. The text says that there were people being added to the church daily, such as should be saved. The reality is we are called to plant the seed, the gospel, water the seed, but only God is the one who ultimately gives the increase. And the picture here of that verse uh, in verse 47 is, is, is really fascinating, but the picture is one of military advancement. The idea is new territory is being won. People are coming. They're being attracted to the Christian message. Why? Because it's a message of love and grace and power and sovereignty, the sovereignty of God. We as Christians rest in that. We exemplify those truths. We favor, we show love and kindness and unity towards one another. And as people get a sense that we are the people of God, that there's something different about us, they're attracted to that. And people are added to the faith. That's the influence that the church ought be having. But why was the church having so much of uh, influence? Why was the church here in Acts chapter 2 so influential? <clears throat> Our text reports this, or reports uh, a couple of things. Number one, verse 43, they had authority. God authenticated his message with power. The apostles and the apostolic power that was present in the early church put a mark of authentication. This was God's people, God's church. There were there was authority, clarity, as the gospel was bring, being proclaimed by the apostles. Which again, you and I are never commanded anywhere in the Bible to perform miracles, but nonetheless, our moral lives, according to several places in the epistles, our moral lives and our living consistent with our message is one of the things that provides authority to our message. In other words, we don't just talk the talk, we walk the walk. Secondly, in verses 44 to 46 of our passage, the unity of the local church, the unity of the Christians is one of the things that made them so influential that they, again, they were proclaiming restoration that we can have, that God loves you. But that message was more authoritative and it was more convincing when they loved one another and the unity that was uh, being expressed by the early church. Now, fascinating thing about this, and I, I recall, if you recall, we made a bigger deal of this earlier in our studies, but this sort of loving unity, caring for their poor, caring for those in need, which by the way, let me, well, first let me explain this and then I'm going to uh, make another comment. <clears throat> Recall, this was something God intended for the nation of Israel all the way back in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 15. Go read that chapter. God wanted his nation to be a loving, benevolent, giving, gracious sort of people that took care of their own. You got a brother in need. You got a sister in need. Take care of them. But that was something that the nation of Israel was, was largely failing at. In fact, in the shadow of the Temple Mount, right, as they're there gathering in the Temple Mount uh, and, and they're, they're gathering as believers... That very temple is the one that Jesus twice in his ministry had to cleanse. Why? Because that temple was not giving. They were abusing the people, the poor people, right? The money changers, the people that were there squeezing the poor for everything that they were worth. And Jesus was abhorred at that. And, and he, you know, he abhorred it. And he, he, he just uh, twice in his ministry cleansed the temple. 
Well, that attitude was completely opposite among the Christians uh, and the Christian faith, because the Christians, they were willingly giving of themselves to help one another. Why? Because not, not only were they commanded to do it, but the Spirit of God was in them. And as Ezekiel 36, 26 declares, God, in giving his own spirit, would internalize his law into the hearts of his followers. And they would, not just from external compulsion, but inward motivation, they would uh, want to care for one another. Let me just encourage you guys. You've done it so well so far. Uh, I have gotten a number of calls from people in the church that have said, Listen, Pastor, we have more than we need. We have this, 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 and this. If there is someone in the church struggling, then please give us a call. We will help them. We will give them what what they need. You see, that spirit, Ruby Mountain Bible Church, praise God, that is the spirit we are supposed to have. Keep that up. If you have needs, call me. There are people in the church so ready and willing to give and to help That's the kind of unity and spirit and benevolence that we need to exhibit as a church. That's what makes us influential. But also it tells us in verse 47 that one of the other things that made the early Christian church so influential is that what I label fidelity. In other words, it says that they were gathering together praising God. In other words, God blessed the message that they were declaring Because he was given the preeminence. They lived lives of praise. They made God the center of their life. They weren't making themselves the center of their life. They trusted in God. And so as a result, as they made their lives were God-centered, then God honored that. And he added to the church daily such as should be saved. So we need to have very God-centered, God-oriented lives. That is a source of our influence. Praise the Lord. But what I want you to see next is not simply these very important ideas of the identity of the church, the activity of the church, um, the, uh, the influence of the church. But I want you to see fourthly, and this is really kind of unique to our particular circumstance, not in church history, right? But in perhaps most of our lives, we are living in a very fascinating time which is evidencing a unique quality of the church of God that I want to camp on for just a few moments, and that is namely the resilience of the church. What do I mean by that? Well, just let me quickly work through this in your notes. You can see it right there on the screen. Acts chapters 3 to 28 tell us a riveting story of the mounting persecution against the early Christian church. Yet against all odds, Christianity survives and they even thrive. If you continue, if you've been with us for any length of time in our study of the book of Acts, recall that the church was faced with numerous difficulties. Here, just depicting the stoning of Stephen, the martyrs of the the early Christian church. The point is, the Christian church suffered much persecution and hardship. And nevertheless, as they suffered, they survived and they thrived. So much so that though the early church first met publicly in the temple, as it tells us right in our, in our text, that they met publicly in the temple and house to house, they soon experienced persecution. And so their public meeting place, and again, think about the early weeks and months of the early Christian movement as Peter preaches, and, they, and there's thousands that come to faith in Christ. They're baptized, publicly acknowledged as Christians, and it says they're gathering in the temple you know, courtyard up in that 35-acre complex, probably underneath the royal stoa or Salomon's porch or somewhere up there. They're gathering publicly. But soon they weren't allowed to do that. Peter and John are arrested. They're threatened in John chapter, or Acts chapters uh, 4 and 5, uh, 3, 4, and 5. There, I mean, just read the accounts. This climaxes with ultimately the martyrdom of Stephen and then the, the outbreak of persecution where Saul of Tarsus leads the way to persecute the early Christian church. And so though they were originally meeting publicly, they soon experienced persecution and they had to meet privately, even secretly. What's so fascinating about this is we have some arche- uh, 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 excuse me, um, archaeological, I said <laughs> architectural, and I'm like, that's not the right word, archaeological evidence of this. This, for instance, is the city of Capernaum. And those of you who went to, with me to the, to the uh, country of Israel, you saw this. In the city of Capernaum, there is this structure. It's actually a Catholic church, but it's built over and atop a 
early, early Christian church. In fact, this has been locally known as the House of Peter. Why? Well, because it was, the Bible just tells us that Peter had a house in Capernaum. And what's fascinating here is that notice this internal house here. You recall our study of this? This smaller structure right here in the middle of the screen was the original house. In fact, there it was two houses, believe it or not. It's pretty small, but there were two houses. And they there was a wall in there. And they broke down the wall. And they added the two rooms together. And they made it a larger structure. We know this was a Christian church because of the graffiti that we found there. It was plastered uh, white. And there were niches put in the walls so that they could have oil lamps and they could light it artificially. They And then they had to break down that middle wall. Um, then they broke it down again. And then you see this outer wall here was they expanded it again a little bit later. And the point is there were obviously, this was a public meeting place. There were people meeting here. But as more and more people gathered, they had to break down walls, join rooms together and expand this house. This is one of the most, I think, I think it's a very exciting archaeological find that evidences, it's tangible evidence of the early house churches that were taking place in the Christian movement there in Capernaum <clears throat> and all over the, the world. But this, this one's located in Capernaum, kind of fascinating. But the point that I'm trying to make is that even amidst persecution, by the end of the book of Acts, which we're going there in our study of the book of Acts, but by the end of the book of Acts, the gospel not only survived, it thrived. It had circled the Mediterranean world and entered even into the city of Rome itself. All of this was, of course, fulfilling the promise of Jesus that he made when he said, I will build my church. That's exactly what was happening. So what I want you to see is note this. Note how resilient the church has been throughout the ages. Whether we can meet publicly or privately or secretly, the church can thrive, and it always has. Why, ha why is this? Why has the church been so resilient? Because at its core, the church is not an organization or an institution. Rather, the church is an organism. It is a living thing. We are empowered by the living God himself, the Bible says. We are the household of the living God. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15 says that we are not limited to time and space, but the church itself, we, we are an organism and we can thrive in any environment. Note how dramatically this contrasts the system of worship in the Old Testament. In fact, this is one of the primary themes of the New Testament, is the major seismic shift that was taking place in the initiation of the New Covenant and the, the community of believers that believe in Jesus, that Jesus labeled the church or the assembly. One of the main things that was very distinct about us is that we can live and thrive and worship God anywhere, anytime, apart from the temple. Now, this is hard for you and I to appreciate because we have lived our entire life without a temple. And yet, when you recognize the centrality of the temple and temple worship in the Old Testament, I cannot overstate this. We have talked, at, talked about this often in our Psalter series, other contexts. I want to do a whole study on it. In fact, when we start our study of the book of Hebrews, we're going to get a lot more into this. But everything in Jewish life centered around the temple. Everything. When you were to worship God, everything centered around the temple. You had to go to the temple. You had to be at the temple. Uh, if not physically at that time, you had to pray toward the temple. Everything centered around the temple. But the New Testament comes with, a, with just a dramatic, seismic shift in its message when it says in Ephesians 2, John chapter 4, that everything is now different. To illustrate this, the nature and location of temple worship, that it was in fact the primary wedge, recall, driven between Jews and Samaritans uh, in, in the history of, of their interaction. Recall, for instance, the conversation of Jesus at the wom and the woman at the well in John chapter 4, where in this scene, Jesus, recall, has been traveling. He's going through Samaria. He is weary. He's thirsty. He sits down at a well. He strikes up a conversation with a woman, and he talks about how he himself is the living water. Well, as soon as the woman discovers that Jesus is a prophet, she asks a question. She says, where is the proper place of worship? Do you remember this? As they're sitting there at that well, and some of you that went to Israel with me, uh, you drank water from that well. Remember that? Pretty exciting. But 
what's fascinating is in this conversation, the woman asks, what is the proper place of worship? Is it here in our mountain or there in Jerusalem? Because this was the primary thing that was the wedge between Jews and Samaritans. This is actually a picture of this old Samaritan temple that was destroyed by Jews, actually, uh, about a yeah, about a hundred years before Jesus. And this is a temple atop Mount Gerizim. And she says, this is where we Samaritans worship. But you guys say we need to worship in Jerusalem. She says, so where's the right way to worship? And Jesus says that there is coming a day that rather than worshiping in Mount Gerizim or as pictured here in Jerusalem, he says, there's coming a day that you, that you will worship neither here nor there. Rather, those who worship the Lord will worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, the depth of that particular idea is so profound it would take us weeks to unpack it but nonetheless the point is when when the spirit of god came in pentecost and we see these little tongues of fire coming in each individual person we have a incredibly life transforming event that took place that we as believers are now not tied to a particular time or place to worship God. Rather, we are able to worship God anytime, any place, and this has provided the Christian church a unique ability to be resilient. Because what's fascinating about this is instead of uh, and, and I'm going to make this challenge here in just a second, but let me make one more point. I think this is fascinating. It's one of my most fascinating um, little tidbits and insights, but contrast Christianity with Judaism. Judaism. Judaism was under complete crisis in AD 70. Just as Jesus predicted, when the temple was destroyed, the Jewish faith was in crisis. Why? Because everything about the Jewish faith was centered in and around the temple. So when the temple was destroyed, there was major question marks. What is a Jew? And there was major crisis in the in the state, you know, in the uh, religion of Judaism. Not so with Christianity. When Christianity suffered persecution and we had to spread out and we scattered all over the known world, we could be resilient. Why? Because we our worship is tied not to a time and place, the temple, but we have freedom to worship the worship God in spirit and in truth, and we have. The, the truth of scripture, the presence of the spirit of God, so that we can be resilient and worship God in any time and place. That afforded the Christian faith a unique ability to survive and to thrive. So consider with me for just a few moments as before we close, I want to make a unique challenge for you. And just, I want you to think about this with me. Instead of viewing the time in which we are living as a source of sorrow, now, yeah, there's a lot of uncertainty that we're undergoing. Our inability right now to meet publicly. We're very prayerful, hopeful. We as the elders here are, are looking into this. We're in conversation um, with with local leadership. We are looking into uh, the, the ability that we will have, hopefully in the very near future, to come out with uh, the ability to reconvene publicly, to meet once again publicly. Uh, but nonetheless, we are living through a very difficult time of the inability to meet publicly. And as a result, well, there's many people that are struggling about this. That, you know, they're really struggling spiritually, socially, what have you. But the reality is, instead of viewing this as a source of sorrow, I want you to see this as a unique opportunity. What do I mean by that? Well, I want to list off just quickly here a number of strengths and weaknesses that has, have resulted from the current decentralization of the worldwide church that we're undergoing. Not just the church worldwide, but the American church, not just the American church, but our church has been largely decentralized. We're not meeting in one place at a given time. Rather, we're meeting virtually. We are doing Bible studies in small groups. We are meeting and calling each other uh, over the phone. We're texting. We're doing Zoom. We're um, you know up, up on YouTube. We're doing all sorts of other things to try and minister to one another during this time. But our church has largely become decentralized. Now, while that is scary, and some people are like, oh no, it can actually be a great, it can be a good thing. It can actually be a fabulous opportunity. There are dangers involved. There are weaknesses involved. Absolutely. I'm going to list off a couple. But there's also incredible strengths. And I want you to seize these while uh, the opportunity is here. What do I mean by this? Well, let me list off. Just I'm going to do three each, just briefly. And then I want to capitalize on this more so next week. I'm going to kind of lay the foundation here today. And then we're going to talk about it more next week. But 
this idea of virtual church, the idea that you right now are sitting on your couch in your living room or whatever, and you're watching me on YouTube, the virtual church is a blessing and a curse. What do I mean by that? Because think about, first, it's a blessing in the sense that by necessity, we have to do it right now. I understand that. Thank God for the technology that's available for us. And, you know, even when we are able to reconvene and meet back together, we're still going to do our best to live stream services for our shut-ins, for uh, some of the older folks of our congregation that are that don't want to come back uh, to meet right away, you know, because they feel more vulnerable to coronavirus. I get it. I understand that. We're going to accommodate that. But there's a danger involved in doing church virtually, especially if that's the only way you do church. What do I mean by that? Because think about this. It can easily fan the flame, as I say there up on the screen. It can easily, virtual church that is, where you sit in your living room and you watch TV and and you call it church. Virtual church can easily fan the flame of self-oriented, consumer-driven church mentality that has plagued America for decades. What do I mean by that? Well, churches, for the last several decades in America, church has been centered around not what you can do for others, but what you can get out of it. Not service, but being served. What did Jesus say? I came not to be served, you know, but to serve, to give my life a ransom for many. That's the way we're supposed to live the Christian life. But Christianity is all... It's been consumerized, if you will. You know, the American culture that is so consumer-driven, it's all about what I can get. And the Christian church has catered to that, the seeker-sensitive movement. Not what you give in devotion to Christ, but what we as a church can do to meet your particular needs. That has been a, a mentality growing in the Christian church, particularly in America, for a long time. But now that we all have gotten a taste of this, the easy freedom of sitting at, sitting at home and not do it, making any effort to meet, go anywhere, to talk to other people, to meet publicly, it's so easy, it's so convenient to sit at home. Do you see how that pampers our selfish side? If we're not careful, rather than being servant-oriented, outward-focused, we can easily become very internal. Church is all about me, not about other people and what I can do to serve. Be careful about that. Secondly, however, virtual church, a weakness that it, and a danger that it poses is that virtual church affords a greater opportunity for anonymity, which is the opposite of accountability. Do you get this? Do you, do you see where I'm going with this? Anonymity, it means namelessness. It means you can tune in, you can dial in, and nobody knows. Nobody sees your face. You're hiding in a corner. You're anonymous. You are nameless. You're faceless. I can't see you right now. I don't know who's watching this. The point is, virtual church affords a greater opportunity for anonymity which is the opposite of what the Bible tells us to do as Christians. Namely, hold one another accountable. If I don't know who you are, if I don't know your strengths and weaknesses, I can't hold you accountable and you can't hold me accountable. This is a vital part of church. And virtual church is, is something where it's easy to drop accountability and let this fall by the wayside. So this is laying upon you, Ruby Mountain Bible Church, this is laying upon us an extra responsibility to seek out personal accountability, to make that phone call, to talk to fellow Christians, to say, hey, this is what I'm struggling. This is what I need prayer for. What are you doing? How are you doing? Let's let's talk. Let's hold each other accountable during this time. What sin am I struggling with? What's my besetting sin? How am I avoiding that? Or am I praying for one another? Are we doing that? You see how important it is to pursue that? Virtual church can make it really easy to get lazy when it comes to accountability. Thirdly, however, virtual church affords us an un unprecedented opportunity for church shopping. In fact, there's a lot of people, there's articles out on you know Facebook, um, all, all sorts of internet sites where people are saying, hey, here's the top 10 churches to check out during quarantine. You know what I'm saying? Check out this church over there. Check out that church over there. And the point is, because you're just a couple clicks away from checking out any church you want, you're no longer tied to your local church. As a result, this can make the church vulnerable to false teaching. We'll talk about this a little bit more next time. 
But we can be very, because a lot of people are tuning in to some church, some big mega church somewhere, and they don't realize what that church really believes and what they are really teaching. And so they're exposing themselves to false teaching. And they could very easily, as Ephesians 4 says, be tossed about by every wind of doctrine. I'm just warning you, be careful about that. But I want us not only recognize some of the weaknesses and the vulnerabilities and dangers that this that the, the situation that we're in poses to us as a church, but I want to think about some of the strengths and opportunities here before we close. All right, give me just five minutes, but think about this with me for just a moment. What are some of the strengths and opportunities that are facing us during this time? I want, I want to list three of them. Number one, this decentralization, the fact that we can't meet one time, one place, all together. Rather, we're all scattered in our own ho homes, own uh, locations. This decentralization helps us remember that we as a church are an organism, not an organization. We can survive whether or not we have a building or a bank account, we can survive as a church. Why? Because church is not a building or a bank account. Church is people. And we can be resilient. We have the Spirit of God within us. We have the Word of God on our laps. We can survive whatever, come what may. And that's important for us to realize. And this time is affording us a unique opportunity to remember this. And so we can meet collectively in public or separately in private. We, as a church, are an organism not tied down to a particular time, location, or a way of operation. We're flexible. And praise God for the way that Christ has designed his church, that we can live through times like this. And we can thrive through times like this. Secondly, I want to point this out. This decentralization of church affords us a greater opportunity to a greater number of people to, who have been equipped to do the work of the ministry. In other words, so many times, so many times, right? As it said, 10% of the people do 90% of the work. That is so true. That is true of our church. But think about this. Those 10% of the people that are doing everything, they're teaching children's church. They are leading small groups. They are, um, you know, preaching in the pulpit. They are leading songs. They're playing piano, whatever. Those people that are active in our church, the 10% of you guys that do that, that are serving the other 90% that don't do anything but show up and sit in a church service, now we're all spread out. You, in your home, in your family, in your sphere of influence, you now have to lead your family. You have to read the Bible to your kids, to your grandkids. You have to answer questions. You have to pursue answers. You have to study. You have to lead your family in prayer. Do you see how awesome of an opportunity that is? Men, particularly those men who are part of my Monday night Bible study. Listen to me now. We have spent so much time spending time encouraging one another, asking questions, answering those questions. Are you doing that with your families? Are you now leading in your little sphere of influence? I'm not there to pastor your church in your home. I can teach you virtually. I can do everything I can to equip you with the truth of Scripture, as I am commanded to do in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. But ultimately, I am a teacher to equip you to do what? To do the work of the ministry. Pray. Read the Bible. Teach your kids. Reach out to your neighborhood. Do the work of the ministry. I can't do it right now. Not in the same way that we were doing it before. That's okay. God is affording you a unique opportunity to step up. Take leadership. Be an asset to this church. Wow. What an exciting opportunity. But lastly, let me make this comment as well. The de this decentralization of the church that we're experiencing has also increased our audience, has it not? There are people right now tuning in to YouTube, watching our live stream that are not a part of our church. They've never come to our church. They, some of which are living in, in, in different states, different countries. There's some people around the world that are tuning in to us right now. In other words... We are virtually reaching out far beyond the traditional walls of our church building. We are having a unique opportunity to have a worldwide, in some cases, influence and outreach. I am hearing story after story 
And if you have another one, share it with me. I am excited to hear what's going on. There are family members of people in our church. There are friends of people in our church that are tuning in, watching our services, asking questions. There are people that are responding to the gospel message unbelievers that are asking questions, apostate believers who are coming back to the Christian faith. Why? Because we are living in a time of incredible turmoil and there's a lot of anxiety and questions that people are struggling with and we have an unprecedented opportunity to talk to those people. Our church and our, the influence of our church is exploding through this time. I am excited about what God is doing don't take your eyes off that. Thank God for what he's doing. Now, next week, what I want to do is I want to capitalize on these big six ideas that I just talked about. I want to look at a few more other passages, and I want to talk about war us. Yeah, some of the dangers that are posed to us right now. But there's strengths and there's opportunities that we're facing right now as well. And we need to be aware of that. We need to be thankful for it. And we need to seize the opportunities that are before us. Ruby Mountain Bible Church, I encourage you. Allow this opportunity for God to work in your heart, in your life, in your family, in your neighborhood, in your sphere of influence. Allow God to work. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this time here this morning. Thank you for this precious privilege we have to look into your word, to be encouraged by it, to be reminded about the church. What is the church? Our identity, our activity, our influence that we ought to be having. The resilience of the church that has been uh, throughout the ages. That, Lord, we can face this no matter what we're going through right now. Lord, you are in control. You have uniquely designed the church to face this. But we pray that you would help us to face it carefully, consistently that we would understand the weaknesses and dangers that face us during this time. But at the same time, we would embrace the opportunities. We would thank you for what you are doing around our community, around the world, through this difficult time of the pandemic. Lord, the early Christian church had to meet in home from home to home, spreading around because of persecution. We're having to do the same thing because of a pandemic. But either way, Lord, we're watching how you can work in a powerfully profound way through whatever circumstances the church faces throughout history. God help us. Help us to seize the day, to thank you, to trust in you, to look into your word, to be empowered by your spirit, to pursue one another, to care for one another, even during this difficult time. I ask that you would bring us back again next week as we contemplate these things further and we think more deeply on these ideas, all for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, my friends. Sure love you guys. Lord bless you. Stay faithful to the Lord this week. Have a great week. Look forward to having you come back next time. Tune in for us or tune in with us as we continue to worship the Lord and contemplate these things together. Lord bless you.